Welcome, Louis, to Hong Kong. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we're so glad to have you here at our SEMP studios. Um, look, you know, you have been doing great things. And um, for example, Wu Assassins, Mortal Kombat, and um, previously Deadpool 2. I think our audiences are really curious about you. Can you tell us about your childhood, how you grew up? Yes, yeah, so I was born in Manchester, England. My father is Chinese from Canton and um, he moved to Singapore when he was quite young and then he moved to London after that. So um, my mother's English, so I'm Chinese and English. Raised kind of in between London, Los Angeles, back and forth. Um, I have a lot of family still in, here in China and in Singapore as well. So we kind of hopped around quite a bit. And uh, for people that don't know who my father is, he's a fight choreographer. He did a lot of films like Indiana Jones, the, um, Batman. Um, he worked, you know, even so far back as like Pink Panther with Peter Sellers. Wow. Yeah, so he's been, you know, doing movies, action movies since, um, since the 80s. So yeah, it's a... Uh, so what was it like growing up in a household with someone that is involved with these like really famous and household name projects? Well, I think as a child, it was, I didn't really think about it that much, because, but it was just like living on the movie set, being on film sets constantly as a kid, just exposed to like creativity and art. And you know, you would, it's like the most magical place in the world, a movie set, you know, you're just there and just people walking around dressed like, ninjas or all sorts of different things you know what i mean and it's kind of like uh when you're a kid you already have such a expansive imagination so this just like this is like the perfect playground to just be alive in and you know seeing so i think i grew up in a in a little bit of a state of awe of like what he was doing I didn't really understand exactly what it was and then as i got older began to study cinema and and study the art form and kind of gain a whole new respect for what exactly it is, you know. And me and my father, we used to just, I mean, he would he was teaching me martial arts when I was five years old, you know. And what do you I, teach a five-year-old? Like just say, you know, how to, how, to, how to kick, how to punch, you know. <laughs> we have so much energy as a kid, right? So it's like Were you nice lethal to channel on the that playground? energy. I'm lethal now. I was lethal then and I was <laughs> lethal now. Yeah, of course. <coughs> no, um, he, he was teaching me at a young age, so that was kind of like an experience that helped us bond together and um, spend time together watching movies, doing martial arts, and it just rooted like a deep love for cinema and for martial arts that, you know. Did you have an aha moment to be like, okay, I want to be an actor now. I want to be in front of the screen, because your dad wasn't always in front of the screen. Uh, he was, but like not yeah. as um, the main cast. Yeah, he's done a lot of roles, mainly as a bad guy, villain. You know, he was in Lethal Weapon 4 and all these different films, but he was always like the tango and cash with Kurt Russell, but he was just getting beat up or doing some um, something treacherous. And, uh, but I think, I don't know if I had an aha moment, but I think, something was like deeply rooted inside that I knew I wanted to be a part of cinema and storytelling and filmmaking. I didn't know what, I didn't know if I wanted to follow in his footsteps and do action stunt, just stunt work, or if I wanted to direct and write. And I do want to do all of those things. I love all of those things. But I think there came a point where I was like, why don't I see faces like me playing a hero or playing a lead character. And if I can make a difference, even a little bit in doing that, then I'm gonna pursue that and I'm gonna try to do that, you know, so. All right. There wa but it was never like one moment. It was kind of like this progressive kind of build up of understanding who I am as a, as a person, who I am as an artist, and what place could I have in this, in this business, you know what I mean, and in this world. So like, it took, a t it took time to like, achieve that you know all right now let's circle back to you saying okay well I didn't see anyone that was that looked like me yeah. like you know and um, we I think we have been visiting this quite often ever since like the uprising of Asian content especially yeah. with this year's Oscars but for yourself like on your personal journey like you know it must have been tough at the beginning 
Yes, very tough. <laughs> like you know, like it was, is it, was it hard for the studios to see you as a as a leading man, despite you having the physique for it? Well, thank you. Um, I think that yes, I think <laughs> it was really difficult. I mean, most of the time, you know, with all due respect to people out there that were casting at the time and stuff, I think they would they would see other ethnicities because they have to. So they can say that they've seen other ethnicities for this role, but then they would ultimately always go with the Caucasian actor, you know. So it, and then and then we would get side little side parts, you know what I mean. And it's it hasn't changed much. There's definitely a big difference be in in the last you know three to five years than when I was when I was first coming up. Massive difference for sure. But I still think there's a really long way to go. I mean. It's fantastic to start to see these original projects coming out and stories being told that aren't necessarily like stereotyped into the Asian market, but um, we have a long way to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was speaking to um, Michael To, and he made a very poignant remark saying that uh, when you cast more than one Asian, like in Beef, yes, then um, you you see the characters there's nuance between the characters yeah. and how important do you think that is i mean you're in Wu assassins and there's quite a lot of different um, yeah. asian characters in it yeah that's the first asian american netflix original with with a full asian cast you know i think that before that casting more than one asian was like absurd it's like one is enough like why, why would they have why would there be more than one you know what i mean it doesn't make any sense i think uh i think nowadays it's kind of Ex it, we're expanding that storyline, but you need people that can trust the storytellers. It all starts like here at the top, right? So like you need people like Netflix or showrunners like John Worth who did Wu Assassins, or even people like Miles, Miles Millar um, who just um, did The Wednesday, you know, but he, like before that, he was doing Into the Badlands with Daniel Wu and myself and, you know, but you need people at the top that have the idea that we're gonna do this show, it's gonna be an all Asian cast, or we're gonna have a super diverse cast with people from all over the world, doesn't matter where they're from, let's just build character. Let's focus on story, let's focus on emotion. Everybody can relate to emotion, story. These, these things, we're all, we're all human, we're all, it's all the same, it doesn't matter what culture you're from. You know about pain, you know about love, you know about grief, you know about joy. All those things are the important things about storytelling and filmmaking, so like, when you see an all Asian cast, now like it's just people, right? Like it's just people. And now you can like dive into character, mistakes and their like flaws, right? Like, cause before it's like, oh, if you cast one ethnic person, they can't be flawed. You know, they can't, you know, it's like, because there's no room for nuance. They're just, they're barely in the movie. They're barely there, you know what I mean? So now that's what we need. We need that nuance so we can show like levels. You know, Beef is a great example. Um, Wu Assassins was a great example as well, and there's a lot of projects that are coming out, especially, you know, from Korea and all these, you know, movies like Parasite, like everything everywhere all at once, levels, nuanced, and now, like, the beauty starts to, like, just shine through, and people start to see things in a different way, you know? Um, on that vein, um, Henry Golding recently was cast as Mr. Elliot in Persuasion. Yes. <coughs> and um, period drama aside, um, I mean, there's all these, for example, Bridgerton is also... Look at that charming um, man. <laughs> but Bridgerton is also colorblind casting. Right. And which, um, how do you feel about that? Well, that's a good question. You know, this is a new concept, so I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. I will say that if it's historical, <sighs> look, it's tricky. Like, if, if, if you were doing a historical movie about, let's say, Genghis Khan or someone, fa some, you know someone infamous in from you know a certain place then and then they they gender bended it and they made it like a different race you know i don't know how would we feel i don't know you know i'm trying to look at it from both sides i will say if it's the creator's choice and they just want to be colorblind and just cast i think ultimately that's a good thing but i think there's some stories that need to be historically accurate Leading on to the next thing, yes. tell us about your directional debut. <laughs> okay. I mean, you. Um, yeah, so this has like been something that I've been working on for quite some time. Um, I wrote a script based on my father's life, and uh, he's had a really pretty 
incredible uh, life as um, as a child. He was he was abandoned basically on the streets for quite some time till he f I think for about seven or eight years he was like left alone to <laughs> when he was a kid, and so like you know he he was brought up in this really this really he was brought up against a lot of odds and um, where he came from and where he went is a just really like a fantastic story. So he won the national championship. I think this is the photo of him. <laughs> and he also won the disco dancing championship <laughs> the same As you year. would. <laughs> As you would. So, and then that was like right around the year in like in 1970s when they were, you know, they had like that famous song Kung Fu Fighting and all that and stuff. And I think my father was adding in elements of martial art to the dance. And at that time it was like unheard of for a Chinese guy to be uh, dancing in the discos and um, and winning you know disco dancing titles and stuff so I thought it was a pretty incredible story so I wrote like a coming-of-age tale that tells his story in three different segments of his life once as one as a as a child um, in China and then one growing up in London dealing with racism and dealing with abandonment issues and anger and pain and then one in the 1970s um, during the disco era and um, but but the point of this would be like that's what we need we need original stories when we need people to be able to tell original stories that are unique to our culture you know and to our viewpoints you know what i mean and i think this is a very unique one in a way because he had to deal with a lot growing up so tell me about the cost for this <laughs> uh I'm still I'm still undecided on whether or not what to do with that. <laughs> are you are you, you going <laughs> to play your own? I think I mean I think that that would be the the logical answer to this, and it'd be something that I that I would want to do. Although I want to focus I want to focus on behind the camera and telling the story properly. So yeah, we will see. What do you want to achieve by telling your father's story? Well, it's something that I need to do as a filmmaker and as an artist. I actually had this epiphany when I was sitting, <laughs> I was sitting in a, f in a like isolation chamber, you know, those like float tank isolation chambers. Yeah. And I was working and I had a, a different project that I wrote that was just a crazy like cult action film um, that I actually got financed. And I was sitting in this isolation chamber <laughs> and I was like just meditating. And like an hour in, I just had this epiphany to just stop everything I'm doing and focus on this. Because this will have more of an impact, I think, for me as a filmmaker. And if it has an impact for me, then hopefully it, it, it would impact other people as well, you know? Right. I think we're a lot more similar than we, th we feel or we see. You know what I mean? Mm. And I think maybe for years and years and years, we've been hypnotized into thinking that we're so different and our cultures are all so different. But really, the, the things that tie everyone together are very simple things that we can, everyone can relate to, you know? But people just experience them differently and mm -hmm. at different times and at different depths. Talking about something that connects us all, your upcoming projects. Um, tell us about your exciting stuff that you're doing with Mortal Kombat. <laughs> maybe okay. something that starts with D. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and don't put that picture up. <laughs> <coughs> nice. <laughs> yes, so obviously we have the sequel to Mortal Kombat coming up. I mean, I think that this is also like a really amazing project. They, you know, this 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 IP has so many different characters from all over the world. Um, it's amazing that they got you know an, uh, a half Asian lead to to lead that project that also does martial arts. So that's great because <laughs> it's like you know really kind of honoring that that tone of you know real martial artists with myself and you know Joe Taslam and Max Huang and Hiroyuki Sanada. Legends, legends, all of them. So you know, it's it's I've, it's been a real honor and pleasure to just be part of this. And so the sequel is going to be just ten times crazier and have all sorts of different new characters involved. And uh, yeah, we're just looking to you know take what the fans wanted and take the fans' commentary and you know what everyone was talking about and just kind of like use those things. And the producers listen to you know the fan base. Um, quite intently and I think that yeah we're gonna make an incredible sequel and we're gonna get released in a time where <laughs> theaters are open this time <laughs>
Hey, don't discredit the first one, otherwise it would never have had the second one, yes, right? Yes, thank you, you're right. No, no, the first one did incredibly well, it was a huge success, it was number one streaming out of all the Warner Brothers movies that year. It still did great at the box office, even though there was no theaters open. You know, not trying to toot my own horn, but it, I was very proud of it, yeah. And But I, but I think this one will do even, even more. But this isn't the first time Mortal Kombat was made, was it? No, no, no. This is a. Uh, this uh, there's been a few different yeah, iterations of Mortal Kombat. I think most no infamously the 1995 one. Yeah, my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever play the game? Of course. Yeah, I played the game as a kid. I have. I'm the oldest of three brothers, so we'd we'd sit and play for hours. How did you feel? I mean, how do you feel about? The 1995 rendition. Now I love that, that movie. That that didn't get very well good reviews. It didn't get good reviews, but you know who cares about reviews? People loved it, <laughs> and, people, <laughs> and people still love it. Um. So, but how did you feel like you know when I mean look, I didn't play that much, but okay. I was at the arcades and okay. like you know it was always Scorpion and Sub Zero. Yeah, of course. How did you feel about Sub Zero being played by a white guy back then? <laughs> well, yeah, that's uh. It's an in, it was an interesting casting choice, which we corrected. Yeah, and so like you know, the I felt this um, this version of Mortal Kombat, like you know, this latest edition of it, um, there was a lot more nuance to it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think I think tonally we tried to make it a lot more nuanced. Obviously, culturally as well as culturally accurate, you know. Um, but you still kept the um, the Mortal Kombat in. Well, we have to. Yeah, yeah we have. That's part of the fun of it. You it know? is. It's it is. the cheeky kind of tongue in cheek fun of it. But yes, we also wanted to like, you know, uh, make it a little more. Um, I don't want to say grounded, but a little more. I just a little more nuanced, I guess. A little more detailed. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think audience. That's what connected audience to it this time. Yeah. Now. But it still <laughs> has all the gore and all the blood and all the fatalities and. That's you know, what everybody loves about it. Yeah, of course. That is that is why everyone loves and it. And the sequel will have even more. Oh <laughs> gosh. <laughs> well, the fans out there, this one's for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, anything else you're working on that you can even give us a hint about? Um. Well, let's see. You know, there's some things. In, there's some. Th there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of great things in the works coming up, um, but I can't. I can't. I can't tell you all the secrets yet. Oh. <laughs> Not even about Deadpool three. Um, Deadpool three is going to be an incredible film. You know, Hugh Jackman's playing Wolverine. I Very think exciting. That uh, that and that dynamic with him and Ryan Reynolds is going to be amazing, and maybe you'll see some familiar faces there. Let's see. Ah, I mean, it's a multiverse, isn't it? It is, yeah. And Shadow and Bone as well, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's, uh, you know, Eric Heiser who wrote Arrival and Dagan Fricklin. They're two of our showrunners, and I think, you know, they did an incredible job, not just only casting and um, behind the scenes, an all-female directorial, you know, uh, cast, but also in front of the camera because we have Jesse May Lee, who's also half Chinese, um, Anna, who plays my sister in this. We, we play twins. And um, yeah, so I think it's very diverse. Even in the fantasy world, it's very diverse as well. So I mean, I think these are the type of shows that represent more of the future of, 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 of what you can do, especially with originals, like stories that are originals and and historic and just filling all sorts of different um, uh, all sorts of different races in one original piece you know so yeah I'm very very proud of that work hopefully we can do another season of that looking forward to seeing you in it thanks very much for your time it was, it was a really great talking to you <laughs> what a pleasure thank you about to go get some dim sum now <laughs> wonderful <laughs>